All right, we're going to get started now. We're going to go ahead and get started now. Welcome, everyone, to this first special event where we're going to have a debate on road funding with the question before these two uh, panelists, these two sitting state senators is, do we need a tax increase in order to pay for our roads? My name is Kyle Malin. I'm the editor of the MERS newsletter here in Lansing. Uh, to my right, probably um, uh, appropriately, is Senator Patrick Kolbeck. He is serving his second term in elected office as the state senator for Michigan's seventh district, that's in Wayne County. He is a graduate of the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor with bachelor's and master's degree in aerospace engineering, as well as a graduate of the Life Sciences Department of the International Space University in Strasbourg, France. Uh, to my left, Senator Curtis Hurtel, Jr. He was elected in the Senate uh, in 2014 to represent the 23rd District, which uh, serves Ingham County. Prior to that, he was the Ingham County Register of Deeds since 2009 and uh, has also a degree from the uh, Michigan State University who uh, may have won a, a game on Saturday. So Michigan State and University of Michigan may be appropriately enough up here. I'm just gonna go briefly over uh, some rules here before we get started. Um, each participant is going to have two minutes to give their opening statements, after which um, I will ask them questions. If there is anyone in the audience who would like to ask a question or suggest the question, rather, we have yellow cards up on that table right there. Uh, if you would like to write a question down and hand it over to uh, the women uh, sitting over there, they will pass it up to me. And um, if I'm able to get it in, I will uh, do my best to do so. This debate is scheduled to be an hour long because of committee assignments from both of these senators. We are going to hold tight to that. So at 2.45, uh, this um, debate will come to an end. And also, please, uh, members of the audience, uh, appreciate the interest in this. Uh, please, I'd like to ask that you restrain from outbursts at all possible. And uh, just please respect both of our panelists, as I know you will. Both of these individuals were elected and are serving 280,000 people in the state of Michigan in their respective districts. So please show them the respect that they deserve. Okay, with that, we will start with Senator Kolbeck. Thank you very much, Kyle, and I'd like to thank uh, Senator uh, Hertel for accepting the challenge. Um, you know, back when we were discussing Proposal 1, I noticed that all the folks that uh, chose to debate me on whether or not on the merits of Proposal 1 were always surrogates for the Safe Roads Yes campaign. I never could get some uh, state elected officials to actually debate the, pro the uh, merits of Proposal 1, so I appreciate the opportunity to talk to an actual state elected official. I think it's fair to say that everybody in this room, including Senator Hertel and I, are eager to go off and uh, fix our roads. Um, and, but I want to clarify, I have three goals for this particular debate. Number one, I'd like to obtain agreement that we're trying to solve the same problem. Um, are we trying to raise $1.2 billion in taxes, or, or, or um, are we trying to raise $1.2 billion in funds for the roads, or are we simply trying to fix the roads? In other words, are we trying to find a solution that fixes the roads faster than they degrade? Two fundamentally different uh, problems. Um, the second goal is that I, I believe that our um, I believe uh, that we need to understand that there's many different ways of uh, finding that solution to our roads. And um, um, so my second goal is that we need to attain agreement upon the list of options available to fix the roads. And I believe that we have the following options before us: number one, reprioritize existing funds, which gets us into the discussion over maybe some programs would need to be cut or not cut. Number two, the idea of reducing expenses, not just in how much it costs to actually um, build and maintain our roads, but also looking in other department areas to free up funds to put to the roads. Number three, leverage existing assets to generate revenue. And number four is increased taxes. So um, notice I have that as a fourth option. <laughs> My third goal is to obtain agreement on how best to fix the roads. Now, while I hope that we can find agreement on goals number one and number two, I believe that this third goal presents the biggest challenge as it gets to the core of governance philosophies between the senator, the senator and I. So he has publicly stated as an advocate of increasing taxes to fix our roads. I'm not. Um, but let's see if we can first achieve goals number one and number two. And I was just curious, Senator Hertel, do you agree with my assertions relative to goals number one and number two? All right, Senator Hertel, your two minutes. Thank you, Senator Kolbeck, for the invitation to debate here today. And I want to thank Kyle Millen from MERS News for pulling this together. Most of all, I'd like to thank the audience uh, for those that came and were interested in this uh, and those that are watching at home. 
Funding Michigan's roads is the single most important issue facing the state today. It's critical to our economy and the future that we get this right. Fixing and maintaining our roads and bridges and ensuring we have a sustainable, dependable source of revenue well into the future should be our top priority. I have to say that I understand people's frustration on this issue. This legislature has taken far too long on this issue and we need a legislative fix now. I think when people were angry during Proposal 1 because they just want the legislature to do its job. And that's one thing that I think the legislature has failed to do. I also think that the people are frustrated because under this governor and under this legislature, they're paying more in taxes, individual citizens are, and they're not getting much out of it. Uh, quite frankly, their schools aren't better, the roads aren't fixed, and I think people are frustrated with the, uh, with the massive tax cuts that have gone to corporations uh, and that are not actually uh, helping people in their everyday lives. We're going to spend a lot of time today talking about what, where Senator Kolbeck and I disagree, but I want to stress that there is common ground between us, between our parties, and between the House and the Senate. We all agree that we need a sustainable solution for Michigan roads. We all agree that we need more dependable roads and bridges. We agree that we need a comprehensive solution that isn't just a punt to the future like we've done in the past. Senator Kolbeck believes we can come up with this $1.2 billion needed to fix our roads and bridges without raising a single bit of revenue. Now, I have to admit, I've spent the last uh, week with uh, this document, which is uh, Senator Kolbeck's plan. And I, I, I understand that he believes this is possible, but I call it a belief only because I don't believe it's grounded in reality. It's not a policy problem, it's a math problem. He's in the minority with, with the opinion, by the way. Not only with me, but with the leaders of his own party. All right, well thank you very much, Mr. Hotel. We are out of the two minutes. Um, Senator Kolbeck, let's kind of address this right here. He says that you have a math problem here in regards to your road funding plan. Can you explain how we get to fixing the roads without raising any additional revenue? Uh, before we talk about the math problem that uh, is perceived here, and I can go through what we're talking about here in, in detail, I want to make sure that we kind of have some takeaways from this, from this debate. And the first takeaway is, first of all, I am in your opening statement kind of alluded to the fact that you believe that the objective here is to find $1.2 billion. Um, I fundamentally believe that the objective should be to find a way to fix the road so that they are fixed faster than they degrade. Um, is it... Uh, are you willing to see that maybe we should just focus on a problem statement that says let's find out where we can, um, that we should be focused on how to fix roads faster than they degrade? Yeah, I think that the, a couple things. I'd say one, $1.2 billion is a number that experts have come up with, not me. Yep. Uh, the experts that are actually in the field, that, the, and that's actually only to maintain our current road system. That's not to build any new roads or actually uh, uh, build even a better system. So. Uh, yeah, I think that we should invest more money in research and development and try to, to build long-lasting roads. But that's not the question that so far has been talked about in the legislature. What's been talked about is how we can actually get the money just to fix our current system. Uh, and so going beyond that, I think, is a great, great discussion, and we can have that. But I'd like to know what uh, magical solution we have. Just, we can't just say we want to build better roads. What's actually your answer well, there? The solution, the key to getting that solution is nailing down what the problem is that we're trying to solve. And I, I would submit, first of all, the $1.2 billion is not to fix our current road system. You're not going to go off and remove the 37,000 poor lane miles that we have in the state with $1.2 billion. All it does is keep the roads from degrading any further. I sat as Vice Chair of Senate Transportation Subcommittee on Appropriations for four years. I've seen the data. I've seen the analysis. Um, my concern is that that $1.2 billion essentially talks about what the size of our operations and maintenance budget is for transportation. And there's kind of two schools of thought there. One is to say that we're currently, our benchmark is around $3.3 billion um, per year on road funding. And the $1.2 billion is from those folks who say that we need to increase our overall transportation spending to about $4.5 billion in order to maintain our current road system. All right? That's not to improve it. That's not to get rid of all the poor quality roads or anything else like that. There's another school of thought, and that's why I phrased the question the way I did, that says, guys, what if we could find a way to decrease the total life cycle cost of maintaining our roads? What if we could find a way to decrease that uh, amount that it costs us to maintain our roads from $4.5 billion 
to try to squeeze it down to as low as the $3.3 billion that we all already have in regards to our, our, our stated funding. So, and, and you found that? Have yeah. you found the answer? Yeah, what is the definitely answer? definitely a method to go off and do that. And then the key is to upgrade our road system. So if you go off and focus on building what I call version one roads right now, and you keep building roads the way that they've been built for years, which means you're going to have a resurfacing project every eight years, and you have major reconstruction, uh, major reconstruction every um, uh, 24 to 30 years on it, then yeah, you're going to be you're going to you're going to have a certain maintenance cost associated with it. But I come from an engineering background, and we used to do trade studies all the time. And one of the key things you'd look at is total life cycle costs. And, and sometimes in Lansing, and this is something that's been kind of frustrating, and that's why I want to make sure we go back into some basics about problem solving, is that um, we kind of always come up with, uh, we, the, the way to, we solve problems in Lansing, we introduce a bill and, and then do a true false on, on, on all the bills and say, do you like it or you don't like it? I have a little bit different approach. I want to go off there and I put together PowerPoints to go off and say, can we win the argument before we win the vote? And, and that's what I'd like but, to focus but on. But how do you improve the roads and how do you get additional lifespan out of it? Is there a magic formula out there that the current road funding community has not come up with? Yeah, we can throw in a couple discussion points on that. To, to, I'll give you just a couple things that we can drill down to later. But I, I don't want to get down into the weeds before we have agreement on these high level um, goals here first. So along those lines, I'll just throw it out for you. There's one company, and by the way, I, serving on, as vice chair of transportation, um, I, I had people coming out of the woodwork saying, I got a better way of building the roads. I got a better way of making them last. And I, I always posed the same question to them. I said, well, please show me the um, life cycle cost analysis. Please show me where you've done this before. And the, I, I only had one person that actually brought all that to the table for me, and, and it was a gentleman from Everlast Concrete Technologies. And he demonstrated that for about 15%, up to 15%, anywhere from 10 to 15% more upfront costs, he could put in a cement hydration catalyst and a sealant that would actually improve the life of our roads up to four times. And that's pretty powerful. And on the asphalt, there's another method called full depth reclamation that's been used out in um, Monroe County that um, cut the price of, of, of resurfacing that road by um, more than half. So there are methods that are out there that are not in our baseline method of doing things. And, but the key fundamental question I'd like to go back to it is, are we trying to raise $1.2 billion or are we trying to fix the roads? Because one's right. a $4.5 billion answer, the other is a $3.3 billion answer. Senator Hertel, this sounds like he's got uh, some plans here that we can cut the cost of roads. Is this the answer? I guess the idea that one company has a magical solution to roads uh, would be great, but the, but the problem with that is uh, that it just hasn't been tested yet. Uh, I did some research on this company as well. They mostly are doing driveways and they're doing some neighborhood roads, but the actual cost on highways that has not been tested. So the, the, uh, what, what this problem is trying to solve is a scientific issue, but it's not actually dealing with the real science that we need to fix our roads. It's deal and we should not be giving giveaways to one company in order to solve this problem. I'm not proposing that. All right, so you're not proposing I'm a not giveaway. I'm not proposing to a giveaway to one company. I'm just saying that, you know, there's an old expression called BHAGs. You set up big goals and you, and you identify whether or not they're realistic or not. This is a case where we've identified the idea of reducing our costs. Um, for the total, the total operation and maintenance costs, and I've identified at least one method that could get us that way. I've got Dr. Lee out at good old University of Michigan here that's got this composite concrete that he likes to talk about that's flex concrete that could accomplish the same things. Right now the price point on it, that analysis has not been completed, so I won't cite that coming out of there, but there's potential to, to increase the longevity and durability of our roads with technologies like that. The key is to set the objective. I do not want the legislature involved in specking out roads. And so the provision that's Neither currently in House Bill 4615 that I worked on with my good friend Senator Shirky actually has a provision that requires the uh, MDOT to go off and do a net present value analysis of our road system on a 30-year planning horizon. And it says demonstrate how we can get to 50% cost value for our roads over that time frame. And I, that's, um, that's a much different way of, of uh, approaching roads development. It's, it's essentially saying, guys, we want to go off and not just look at churn and burn with the current version one roads, but I want to find a way to upgrade our road system so it actually costs less to maintain. That's what we do in the private sector all now, the time. Now, Senator, Her or Senator Colbeck, then, do we still need to put additional revenue, though, into the roads so we can improve the roads? And you've, you've laid some groundwork as to where you think that can be done. Yeah. But are, do there need to be some reallocation of funds in either the general fund or 
uh, anywhere else where we would actually be putting more money into the roads through our existing resources. Yeah, I would submit that you can, it, it's all a matter of how fast you want to get rid of the poor quality roads. So the more money you put in up front, the faster you get rid of the poor quality roads, the sooner you get to the sustainable funding level. So yeah, you can put in more. And I think the place to start is where we have common ground already between the House and the Senate. Both have passed out legislation that says that we can repurpose $700 million of existing funds. The current budget that we have right now um, already features $400 million, a bump from our $3.3 billion threshold. So that leaves a gap of, th of $300 million. And so really this whole discussion of whether or not to get a sustainable road plan focuses on how do you get to that $300 million to go off and, and meet the uh, target that's already been agreed to by the House and the Senate. First of all, the House and the Senate don't actually have a plan. They have a wish. Uh, there is no actual uh, identification of where those cuts come from. So the idea that we can just uh, cut our way to prosperity without actually telling anybody in the room before we actually vote on it what those cuts are going to be is just not realistic. Uh, beyond that, uh, there is there's still this increased amount of funding. I've read through your plan, uh, and I believe that it's fiscally irresponsible. We talk about the, uh, these restricted funds and how we, can, how we can open some of those up. Most of them are paid for by fees. It's unconstitutional to use a fee as a tax. <laughs> Uh, we make decisions uh, like Solomon and the baby. Uh, is it real, for example, you cut $500,000 from uh, sexual assault money on campus. Is it really worth uh, half a mile of, lane, of road to actually take money away to actually stop sexual, assault, sexual assaults on campus? You cut money from the newborn screening fees. Uh, this is, these are, are screenings that are done to make sure the kids don't have uh, diseases that will kill them. 200 babies are caught every year because of that. You cut those funds as well. At, at some point, budgets are about priorities. And I think that at this point, uh, you know, it's all good to sit here and say we have some magical solution in the future. You want to put more money in uh, research and development? I'm all for it. I think the problem is, is that you want to do it for free. There's not a magical tree in the back of the capital that makes money. And more importantly, what you want to do as far as I can tell is cut the wages of the workers, make sure there are less actual qualified skilled workers actually building these roads, and then on top of that, uh, cut the actual funding that goes to the, the, the projects at the end of the day, and then find some magical solution that makes our roads last longer. None of this has been tested. None of it is scientific in reality. So what my question to you is, uh, if your plan is so good, if, if it's conservative and, and uh, it makes sense, then why is not one other leader from your party actually accepted this plan? Is Arlen Meekoff not a conservative? Please understand that the line items that you called out specifically, um, the big proposal, and by the way, we've got a moving target. So every budget year, the different items that are up for consideration change. But those were items that were added as GF increases in our budget. So one of the proposals that I had um, was to simply freeze the general fund allocation in last year's budget. And, and so, um, and, and so those line items you're talking about, they would not have been added to the budget. So to call them a cut is kind of disingenuous, personally. Um, when you actually go into the rest of the items that are out there, what I like to do is frame, here are the different items that are out there. So I've looked at 344 restricted funds that have been identified. And when I'm talking about repurposing funds from restricted funds, I'm not talking about using them for purposes other than they've been uh, specified doing. It's within the domain of the particular agency that's actually using those funds. But those agencies also receive general fund allocations. And so what I'm proposing on doing is allocating those restricted funds to support the duties of the agency and then offset the need for additional general fund revenue, thereby making that general fund revenue available for others. And yeah. case in point, DNR Trust Fund. DNR Trust Fund. We've got a case where that the use of the DNR Trust Fund is set up so that we provide amenities for, for people, and there's about $27 million a year. Um, that can be repurposed in that context. There's a lot of roads inside of national parks. There's a lot of roads inside of state parks. Did that money come from our road fund or does that money come from our DNR trust fund? And I, I would submit that if you want to go off and look at ways to go off and repurpose it for the original purpose, which is getting people access to those parks, you should start looking at that. I don't want to just squirrel away $1.6 billion and say we can't touch that. I want to make sure that we have a good, a non-emotional discussion over whether or not those, uh, those, uh, expense, or those funds are being used to commensurate with their expenses. And if there's a way to offset the use of that with uh, uh, less uh, dependency on general fund, let's pursue that. But what you're talking about is a legislative shell game that's been played by this legislature and past legislature for decades. 
if you actually go through and, talk and look at it, you're talking about taking money, for example, for newborn screenings. Newborn screenings, they actually screen kids for diseases that if not caught, those children are more likely to die. 200 are caught, are caught every year. If you're taking money out of that fund and repurposing it for something else, we're not going to do those screenings. You talk about the autism coverage fund, although there's no, almost no money left. Are we willing to take autistic kids, uh, uh, funding from autistic kids to actually cover, it's $12 million, so uh, 12 miles of road? I mean, I, I, I just don't understand. You, you can't just play a legislative shell game. People paid these fees because they expected a service. And then you're going to take that money and repurpose it to the general fund. That's what this legislature does. It, it, we have to stop doing that. We have to actually find a long-term sustainable plan. I think you're demonstrating why people are so cynical about politics as usual, because you're trying to find items that are being, um, that, uh, and, and trying to throw it out there, throw bombs out there that you know are going to get headlines. But when you look at the autism fund, this is a case where we've already repurposed approximately $10 million out of, out, of, out of that fund previously in budgets because it simply was not being burned at the rate that it was uh, originally allocated to support. So the fact that I'm even looking at it, you use it as a red flag to go off and score political points, but really all I'm doing is saying let's look into it and make sure that the incoming funds and the fund balance is matched to the, to the actual needs. I'm not talking about cutting services, and to, to claim so is in, in genu disingenuous. So I'd like to recalibrate, though. We still haven't gotten a Agreement on that goal number one. So how are we going to so, get into the weeds? So, so what we can what do, do you, is what problem are we trying to solve? We're trying to solve the problem of, a, of the the roads here in Michigan that are crumbling and falling apart. Right. That's so, that's, that's 1997 is the last time we did anything about this. By the way, is that a one point million million dollar problem? By the way, Governor Engler, who I'm pretty sure that you'd consider a conservative as well, is the one that signed that. I don't bill. play the name games. So, I don't play the label games. I, f I focus on solving problems. So please help me with well, that. Well, that's fantastic. But I, but but that was a, Governor Engler was the last one that signed that signed it. I'm pretty sure he's a conservative. If we had indexed that to inflation at the time. We'd already have enough money to fix our roads now. We're pretty damn close. My point is, is that, you, that uh, you, know, you keep saying that you have a solution. You, you put these things on your website. These aren't actually your solutions. These are just ideas, I guess, now. So where do you find $1.2 billion or any amount of money to get to the point where you actually want to spend on roads? Where, where does the money come from? Help me first. I, I need to get agreement on that goal number one. If we can't get to that, the rest of this debate kind of gets useless because it's all about what problem are we trying to solve. So are you trying to solve a $1.2 billion problem? Or are you trying to, are, are you want to broaden the, the opportunity for different solutions to actually focus on fixing the roads faster than they fall apart? I, I think he said he wanted to fix the roads. I think I said at the, the very beginning, too. the first the first thing I said was we all agree we need a sustainable solution for Michigan roads. Okay, good. Your contention is, is that we can do it without any new money. I'd like you to explain where, the, where that actually works. We've been doing it without new money for a long time, and the roads are crumbling around us. So yep. could you actually give me the details where you actually find that money? That's the question. Well, we've got a little time to get into details. Let's go to the next question, though, first. Um, I, I really want to get back into the fact that we've got four different We've got four different methods on going off and, and identifying ways to put more money into the roads. First one is to reprioritize existing funds. You've called out a couple cases that say if I do a GF freeze, that's essentially a reprioritization item. So that's something you can talk about in, gener in general. The next is looking at expense reductions. So the idea of reducing the costs of maintaining our current road system falls into that bucket, as well as looking for reductions in other budget areas. That's key. The next area is the I'm idea sorry, real quick. Where are the actual cuts? You know, first of all, a GF freeze is a cut. cut programs cost more over time. So I, I would just like you, again, you can say, oh, I'll, we just I'll, freeze this. And this. Give me actual cuts. The, Give me programs that you will end here in Michigan. Cuts, That's what I want to know. Let's try to be systematic with our problem solving here for a sec, because so many times in, in Lansing, um, everybody just throws something up and tries to see if it's, it sticks. And a lot of times that's driven by lobbyists, not by what the best approach is to, to solve a problem. OK, we do so have I, 35 minutes here, though. Yeah, no, no, no. I, I got plenty. Believe me. And if you want to find out all the specific cuts, I've identified them in editorials. And I'll get to those. But let's go off and try to get on our problem solving well, hat, shall we? So number one, I mean, we already agreed on that. It's how to, f we want to fix the roads. That's the key thing that we're focused on. $1.2 billion is not a magical number in that context. So number two is, um, you understand that there's four methods to go off and fix our roads. Tax increase is only one of them. So uh, do you agree with the other three items that are out there and, and, and cited as different ways of going off and let's, fixing the roads? Let's go through each one again. So, one right, is so number one is the idea of reprioritizing existing funds. So the idea of every budget year we come up and we have a list of one-time items and we have a, 
a list of general funds. List the cuts, and then we can talk about those. Keep going. Yeah, yeah, we'll get into those. Um, so do you, is that viable, you think? Is that something we should You list the cuts, and then we'll, you cannot ask, is it viable that we cut funding without actually pointing to an actual budget line? No, I just that, want to I mean, that, that you, you talk about lancing gobbledygook in games. You pretend like these aren't actually real programs or actually real people they affect. Yeah. So, again, if, if you, I'm more than happy to talk about a specific budget line if you have one. But instead, if you would rather just sit here and say, well, we just freeze budgets, and then we do this, and then we do that, again, there is no magic tree behind, uh, money tree behind the capital. You have to actually point to real specific yep. programs that are cut. And what I've are we going to stop right, doing well, as a state? I, okay. So let's see. Uh, so I, I want to understand, though, that because the only thing I'm hearing from folks right now is that you've got to increase taxes. It's the only way to fix the roads. Right. So if you acknowledge that there's three other methods, at least, that have been identified, then we can move on to next stage. Okay. And so you said, um, well, you just, I mean, I'd like okay. to hear from the center. Sure. Again, when you tell me which items we're cutting, and you have an actual plan that actually shows where you can find $1.2 billion, I mean, this is kind of an ex exercise in futility. You can keep repeating the same thing over and over again that we can find the money, but at the same time, you have to actually show we can. When you were chair of the state police budget, yep. Uh, you know, you, you talk all the time about austerity and government living within its means. When you were chair of the state police budget over four years, a 50% increase in actual cost, over $100 million. If you're so good at finding cuts, then why couldn't you cut the budget when you were sitting up on, in, and in control we're, in this chamber? Yeah, we were talking about public safety, and if you wanted to start throwing bombs instead of solving problems, I guess, well, you know, uh, we, can, we can have some fun with that. But I, I'm preferring not to go there. I actually am focused on fixing the roads right now. Okay, so uh, I'm focused on fixing the roads too. But you have to an you've answered zero questions that I think I've, put, I, I put, I've, I've sat here and listened to your questions and I've tried to answer them. Okay. My question back to you is, you said that we can make this up through cuts. Could you list the specific cuts and the people that it actually affects and which programs would you like to stop doing in Michigan to find this amount of money? Okay, first and foremost, we've got, let's go into the details of the solution and if you're willing to go off and accept the other things besides tax increases, um, that's a good starting point because uh, that's, that tees it up for some good discussions. First of all, we're at, I want to point out what I said at the beginning here. If your goal is to go off and um, fix the roads, which means you want to um, uh, you know, fix the roads faster than they degrade, then $700 million is fine if you actually upgrade the roads in the process. So the basic premise is that as your every single construction year, you're repaving about 2 to 3 percent of our pavement inside the, inside the state of Michigan. When you do that, you're converting from a $4.5 billion maintenance problem to a $3.3 .3 or $2.5 billion maintenance problem. So your expenses decrease over time as, as it's going forward. So, but let's start off with the $700 million and say, how much does that get us? Does that get us to the point where we can fix the roads faster than a degrade? I, I'm going to contend that it does, and we can get into the details of that later. So in order to get this $700 million, and I know mean, walking through something systematically is something that's really not, they don't like to do up in Lansing. They just like to get it up for a vote, and then you go for it and just accept something as truth. But I want to walk, walk people through the reasoning here, so please bear with me. $700 million. We've got $400 million incremental funds already put into the budget for this year. So we've got a benchmark that says that we can put in 3.7. So now we've got a, a $300 million gap. And so when we're talking about $300 million gap, just like uh, in football lingo, um, it's a lot easier to convert third and two than it is third and ten. And this is a case where we can go off and, and open up a lot more options on how we go off and, and solve that $300 million gap. One way of doing it is with um, simply looking at the Michigan Strategic Fund. There's about $179 million put into that. And uh, a lot of people have pushed economic development as a, um, as a priority here in the state of Michigan. But they've also, those same people, have actually cast economic development as a key reason why we need to invest in our roads. Well, my proposal is, well, instead of doing a targeted friends and family incentive program like uh, what you'll see in Michigan Strategic Fund, why not do a more broad-based economic development activity that benefits all of our citizens and all of our businesses and put that money into our roads until we get to the point where we're sustainable? Um, and that amount can vary year over year. So okay, that's so the first item. MEDC, okay. So that's one item. Another item is, you know, we keep talking about this, a budget stabilization fund, but I want to make sure it's right-sized um, for us right now. Budget stabilization fund, the purpose of that is to make sure that we've got a savings account that in case our actual revenue comes in lower than our forecast revenue at our revenue estimating conferences, we've got a sufficient balance to cover our, our, our general fund uh, disbursements. 
Well, we have about a $10 billion in general fund budget every single year on it. The historical variations on that revenue estimate have been about plus or minus 4%. So it makes sense that we should have a balance of around $400 million sitting in that account. Right now, we got a $614, $619 uh, million dollar balance. So I would submit that, and we put in, I think, another $95 million or $75 million this year. Um, I would submit that that money should be available because it's such a public safety concern. People are worried about potholes. Let's put that money into the roads, and we don't, it shouldn't impact our credit rating or anything else. I, there, those are just two line items without breaking a sweat that get us to the 300. But a couple of things. One, the House and Senate never actually said what their plans were to make those cuts. So you can say there's agreement, but no one's agreed on the actual cuts. And two, and I think this is more important, those are one-time solutions. We need a long-term, sustainable plan to actually fund our roads. We don't need one-time Lansing gimmicks. That's what we've had for more than a decade now. We made an agreement in 1997 to actually increase the gas tax to get us to where we need to go. We didn't index it to inflation, and we've lost money every year after that, which is why our roads are in such rough shape. We can go out and tell the people and lie to them and say, hey, we can do this with what we currently have, and we don't need to invest more money, and we don't need to actually fix this problem, or we can actually do our job, which is lead, and actually go out and say, we have a real so we have a real problem. We need to come up with real solutions. The idea that we that that we can just build better roads is it would be great. No one would be opposed to building better roads. I don't think there's any person in this room, any person in America, any person anywhere that would say, "Hey, building better roads sounds good." You have not given any answer of how that actually happens, what it costs, and you can't do it again with less skilled labor. And when you voted for prevailing wage. You cut the actual wages of the people that are that are going to actually be doing the, these programs, and Please it's don't put words you believe in, my mouth. in the free. I didn't push wait, for prevailing you, wage. you believe in the free. What? I didn't push for prevailing wage. That's you voted. For, you voted for it. I voted for it, but that's not part of this road plan. It, it's in your. It's in your documents. You, it's, it's an option. Okay. Well. No, I, I'm no. serious about uh, that. Senator, but real, real quick, here's the thing. I, I, I assume that you, know, you talk about the free market a lot, and the free market's important. If we pay workers less, then won't they go to other states where they're actually paying a fair wage? Won't, they, won't the most qualified people go to, where, go to those states? Won't we get less qualified people actually building our roads and therefore get worse roads? Now, I, first of all, I, I don't want to make this about prevailing wage. It's one of the options on how to get there. Um, what I'd like to do, though, is go off and drill in. You, did, you, you made the claim that I, everything that I proposed was only one-time funding. That's not the case. The allocation for Michigan Strategic Fund every single year, that's an ongoing appropriation of around $179 well, million. The, the, budget then, the budget stabilization the fund. The budget stabilization fund had $95 million that was put in. That's an ongoing that could be contributed in there. And the point is, and, and this is where you know, the attention span becomes really important because what we want to try to do is go through and be very systematic about how we do this. There's three different areas that I've talked about before you get to tax increases. So uh, there's a time phase, and I'm an old project management professional. There's a sequencing of events that you have to put into place. Now we get into expense reductions. You want to talk about real opportunities for going off and reducing um, uh, or freeing up more money for the roads, that's where you zero in. It's in, in the expense reductions. But you can't do that in a just add water um, proposal. You have to, it takes time to go off and get those expense reductions actually to start realizing them. Um, and so my point is, you tee it up with some of the low hanging fruit that we have right now in the budget going into the next year's appropriation. But at the same time, you're going off and implementing the methods that are going to start reducing the expense, reducing the cost of government. And you know, the road stuff that we were talking about, building roads that last longer, that's just one element of it. You know where the biggest opportunity is to reduce costs? It's not in prevailing wage. It's not in the stuff that everybody likes to um, throw out there to get everybody's dander up. It's in the idea of providing health care at a lower, a lower cost with higher quality. And there's a solution that I passed out in, in the, uh, through the legislature, this PA, 50, or PA 522 of 2014, that promotes a, a the service delivery mechanism called direct primary care. It's been proven time and time again to reduce costs by 20 percent. And the reason this is important, and that's why I want to frame this discussion around why would you increase taxes when you got opportunities to actually reduce expenses, is that we've got a, uh, uh, right now we spend about $1.5 billion every year on 51,000 state employees. 20 percent off of that is 300 million. Guess what that gap was that we were talking between the 400 and the 700? 300 million dollars. You want so to we're talking about making cuts to employee health? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's the way it gets pushed out in the uh, media here. But the, the part that you're missing is the fact that it actually improves the care for less money. This is actually one of those rare cases where you can make cuts and actually improve the delivery of services. 
And, and I want to highlight that if you apply that same solution set to Medicaid, that's a $14 billion problem. You can't do that. 20% associate. They've done that in the state of Washington. They've realized those benefits. So you can't say you we can't have, We already do have it. managed care here in Michigan. Yeah, it's not managed care. Money. It's exactly so. the opposite of managed care. It actually gets rid of all the overhead between a doctor and a patient. You save money and improve the quality of care. Because last time I checked, MBAs don't add any value to the delivery of care to our patients. So, um, so this, is a, this is something that is a huge opportunity. Because it actually, what's 20% uh, what's off of uh, 14 billion? That's 2.8 billion. 40% of that is a state match. Now we're starting to look at the $1.2 billion that if that's the number that you really want to go at, we can get it with just that one change alone. And uh, it just takes a will. Again, I would say that you know, you've had five years here in the Senate. Yep. And uh, I've assumed that Arlen Meekoff is a conservative to you, yes? I'm not going there with the personality game. I'm asking a politics. question. Okay, but I no think more I, 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 politics. I'm I, focused on the numbers. Okay, well, I, hold I just on. want to know real yeah, quick. Yeah, right. I, and I think I think the question that he's getting at, uh, Senator Colbeck, is how come you've had trouble getting support behind your ideas here in the Senate? Um, that's a pretty big question here. I think it's because I'm approaching problems, as you can tell here, with not even be able to get to agreement on goal number two here. That there's different ways of solving problems. When I came here, and these senators aren't willing to solve problems in this no, way. I think just takes some time. Organizational change is a whole discipline that comes up in uh, in uh, business schools and how to best accomplish that. I just want to put in context why sometimes it's tough to get people to think in that way of, of thinking. Because when I came here for orientation, you know, when I was first a newly elected senator, I, I came to uh, a program called the Legislative Leadership Program. And they paraded lobbyist after lobbyist and expert after expert, subject matter uh, expert after expert. And they presented all the issues we would face as in state government. And the solution to every single one of those problems was to increase taxes. And I know for a fact that, I mean, I've been a management consultant for 11 years. You don't always get the opportunity to go off and increase the amount you're going to go off and charge to your customer for your services. You've got to find ways of doing business better. And what I'm trying to do, and why it takes a while, is to change that environment to get them to respect the taxpayers and their wallets and actually look at ways of delivering government better. Now, the governor's done some efforts, and he's got a lot of initiatives around lean management that are, that are taking place, but it, it takes a while to go off and do that. But we've had a 10 billion, we've had a flat growth in the general fund for 10 years. We're spending, you know, 30 years ago we were, spent, we were paying for 80% of the cost of college tuition. Now we're spending uh, only 20%. We've made massive cuts. We're cutting bone now. The idea that we can just cut our way to prosperity is not working. So, you know, I, I like, listen, I'm all for doing things better and sitting down and figuring those out. The problem is that most of what you talk about in terms of the road, for example, you still have not explained how we actually get there. So, I, it, you know, I, we talk about your question, too. I, I, I've acknowledged that we can do some things better. I'm not opposed to that at all. Yeah. But what I would like to ask you is, and I'm going to ask one more time, uh, how do we actually uh, spend money on roads? What magical elixir will actually make our roads last longer for cheaper? All right, let's zero in on the Everlast Concrete technology. So if it's 15% extra upfront cost on material and, uh, and labor, um, and uh, you get roads that last four times as long. When you have a construction project that you used to do um, four times in the span of 30 years, and you're only doing it one time in the span of 30 years, there's serious cuts associated with that and serious cost savings. And by the way, our people don't see those orange barrels as often either. And so where has it been tested? Yeah, and what has MDOT done when you've presented this to them? Are, MDOT are they is taking elements of that, of that solution. They've taken the sealant product, for example, and applied it retroactively to certain road projects that are out there. But unless you put the cement hydration catalyst into the mix, into the aggregate, while you're pouring the cement, you don't realize those benefits. So, so, so if you do all this preventative maintenance and so forth, you think we only need $700 million in new revenue as opposed to $1.2 billion. Right. Is that, is that what you're saying? Right. And so we really, is this is really only a $700 million problem as far as you're concerned? Potentially. And, and this is really a case of how fast do you want to get rid of all the poor quality roads. As I submitted before, if you do $1.2 billion with just the version 1 roads that we have right now, you never get rid of the 37, you never put a dent in that 37,000 lane miles that are currently poor quality. And, and whose math makes it four times more, make it last four times longer? It's demonstrated from the, from the, uh, from the vendor. And, and okay, well, I mean, again, you know, I have a bridge to sell you too, but it's falling apart in Michigan. I mean, I, I don't understand. 
the vendor told you it will last much longer. Do they have do they have specs? Do they have uh, evidence? Is there a place where highways have actually used this before? I mean, is there any evidence that this actually works? Or is they it used it in Ohio and Kentucky? They've got film uh, photo based evidence of when they started the projects. I mean. The idea of me going out there and doing a core sample out in Ohio and Kentucky, I haven't gone that far. To I'm go some independent it. source. But the idea, and I want to highlight that it's because somebody's going off and doing it, that doesn't mean that's the solution that we go off and push. It just shows that it is possible. And, and too often in government, we immediately go back to the, uh, hit the easy button and say, just ask for more because it's too hard to figure out ways of doing things better. I think we need to push the envelope and get people to do better. You talked about my duty as, as uh, my time as state chair on the Department of Military and Veterans Affairs. We actually set a high target in regards to making sure that our veterans were taken care of better. We actually had what was uh, like a service level agreement where it was performance based metrics around the funding that we provided them. And when we did that, we found out that we turned from one of the last, um, uh, from the worst performing state agencies in the whole country to number two in the nation for providing fully developed claims to our vets. So the key is start measuring it, start measuring the key things that are important, let the people who are in those particular departments understand that you have high expectations and, and, uh, and get out of their way so that they can achieve them. You know, you say that government's, uh, you know, that constantly asking for more. Uh, but haven't you fallen prey to that same thing? I mean, one, we talked about the state police budget and the $100 million uh, last year. Uh, there was a $30 million project in your district, uh, part of it state funded, that you fought for on the Senate floor because there was an IKEA in your district and it increased, increased more traffic. Yep. I mean, you fought for that because you thought that maybe if we can get IKEAs in all of our districts, you'll help fund our roads too. Yeah, it was a oh. public safety issue. Okay. We had the number one, number two safety incident areas in, in, the, in the state. And I had been sitting through transportation committee after transportation committee saying that we're going to allocate our funding based on safety as number one priority. When you actually look at how they allocate the funds, it has nothing to do with safety. The, the, Pareto, uh, the, uh, the portfolio management technique just focuses on and road conditions. Okay. I get it. And you got so it I'm not going to apologize. You, you got it in your mark, and I'm probably, safety. you did your job. I appreciate that. I mean, that's, it, it, you know, I don't have a problem with you doing that. What I have a problem with is that you trying to get progress for your district or in budgets that you manage and then stopping progress around the state and actually fixing our roads. All right. We've got some actual questions from the audience that I think are pertinent here that I would like to get to. Senator Kohlbeck, a question for you. Uh, regarding the research and development that you talked about uh, prior, the question is, do you think MDOT is doing their job as opposed to uh, in regards to staying on top of advancements such as you're talking about? I think we need to provide a little bit more focus to some of their activities because they have a the equivalent of a sandbox. They've got a lot of different uh, projects that are sitting off to the side that are intended to go off and improve the efficiency of how we do roads. The problem is, and this uh, I thought th sat through a lot of testimony to this effect, is that we never seem to convert those projects or those sandbox items into actual um, changes in how we build our roads. And we never realized the benefits that ostensibly are the reason why we kicked off these uh, development or pilot projects in the first place. So I think we need to do a better job in regards to, you know, setting the bar and saying, hey, the reason we're investing in some of these pilot projects is so we can actually build roads that last longer. And I would submit that some of the key things that we need to do in the transportation budget is put up targets, just like we did out in the Department of Military and Veterans Affairs, and say, I want to make sure that we've got a, we currently maybe, uh, we currently fix 1,400 state trunk line lane miles per year or whatever. Let's set a bogey of um, saying that we want to be able to fix um, 1,600 per year and, and, and within the same funding constraints that we have. And just to put a backdrop against that and to make sure that everybody understands we've got room for improvement there, Michigan right now, I mean, there's a lot of discussion in Proposal 1 about per capita spending. That's a bogus um, um, uh, number. Road contracts are priced out based on the dollars per mile. And when you look at the amount of money that Michigan spends per lane mile, it's 7% more uh, per lane mile than the national average, yet the condition of our roads is in the bottom 10. That tells me we're not exactly getting the bang for our buck that we deserve. And if you look at it on a, on a per mile perspective, we're spending 27% more per mile. Okay. That's a metric we should be tracking in appropriation. They, they don't have snow in Arizona, for example. So, I mean, there are reasons why some of those numbers are true. We've also cut MDOT employees to the bone, and bone as well in their budget. So you're asking them to do more with less, which seems to be a constant ma mantra among your party is to do more with less and live in, un, un, under our means. Uh, I get that. I'm, with all, I'm all for doing more with less. But you, don't act, you can't expect that continually to work forever. And again, I, I think that the problem with most of this debate has been uh, that, that you don't really have a long-term solution. I mean, we talked about 
the uh, the uh, you have one concrete company that said they can do this, and I mean, really, in all honesty, if if you had a plan that was sustainable, don't you think that Rick Snyder would jump on it? Don't you think that Arlen Meekoff, who's a, a conservative that does not want to raise taxes, I can tell you, I've met him, uh, he has no interest in raising taxes. Don't you think Kevin Cotter would jump on it? If it was possible, don't you think that those people, I mean, it, it, are you just not doing a good enough sales job? Is that what you're saying? I, mean, right. I don't get it. Now, we do have another question here from the audience that I do want to get to. Um, Senator Hertel, you were a no vote on the Senate roads package that was voted on earlier this summer. Um, that package was going to raise taxes to the range of $700, $800 million. If you were a no vote on this, the question is, what is an acceptable level and how much are you willing to raise taxes for the roads? Uh, a couple things. Uh, I voted no for, for several reasons. One, I think that the middle class is, been, is paying too much as it is. I think that, that this administration has raised taxes on the middle class uh, and cut corp taxes on corporations of up to a billion dollars. Uh, and we're doing nothing better, my, you know, and we need to make sure that we're actually investing uh, in our future, and we're not doing that right now. So that, that's, that, that is why I voted no. Uh, also, they would not identify the cuts. We asked them where the cuts were. It's some magical cut ferry that's eventually going to come down and tell us where the money's coming from, but no one actually told us where those actual cuts were, and I'm not going to vote for something knowing, not knowing what the actual answers are. And uh, third was the prevailing wage issue. Uh, they, they're one of our first votes in this state, uh, we, you know, we, we came in on election day, on a, uh, swearing in day, and we were talking about how bipartisan we're going to be and work together. And the next day, the very first vote was to actually cut the wages of the workers who actually build our roads while there were actually guys strapped into scaffolding, fixing our Capitol building and making it look nice. I thought that we were being extremely hypocritical. And I'm not going to vote for a roads package on the backs of the working men and women of the state. It's not going to happen on my watch. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, anything you want to respond to on that before we get to the next question, Senator Kolbeck? Yeah, I think the key thing is you're going to be increasing the burden on the middle class taxpayers and the same people you claim to be protecting because you're advocating a tax increase. And, and so when you start talking about it, if you want to go the corporate income tax route, well, we can debate whether or not that's a better tax than, than going off and increasing gas taxes. The, my position is that the only way to really guarantee that you're not going to be impacting the same people you claim to protect is by not proposing a tax increase. All right. Another question from the audience is, uh, Proposal 1 on May 5 went down very hard, 80-20. Uh, Senator Kolbeck, why, what message did you take away from Proposal 1? The same message I'm trying to convey to people today is that people are demanding better. Um, there's two different takeaways that I heard coming out of Proposal 1 and in all the debates leading up to it. Is number one, we don't need to raise taxes. We can work within existing funds. And to put that in context, when I started here five years ago, our budget was $46.8 billion. It's the latest one that we have is a little over $54.5 billion. It's not that our, our, our uh, revenue has been decreasing. It's actually been increasing. Um, the other thing was that people were tying too many issues into the same, into the basic concept of trying to solve the roads, which is kind of the point of me trying to nail down exactly what is uh, the objective of this discussion and our, our push to fix the roads. It's to narrow it down and say, let's focus on just fixing the roads. And we'll deal with some other problems that are popping up separately. And you notice that the road funding discussions that we've had recently are, are within two months of actually um, getting an 81 percent no vote from our voters, we had a tax proposal that increased taxes, and then a few months later, road discussions fell apart because of uh, attempts to tie roads to Medicaid expansion and HICA tax. So now we've got a case where we're, we're repeating the same thing that we were doing before, which is one of the reasons I said that it is about time that we had a public debate over how we're going to go off and do this, because some of the stuff that's happening in the back rooms are not respecting the will of the people. I want to make sure we're listening to their voices. Senator Hurtel, what message did you get out of Proposal 1? A couple of things. One, I think that uh, Proposal 1, the failure is a political Rorschach test that any of us can, can, wherever we look at the world and how we see it, tells us how we actually thought it failed. Uh, I think it was because if people wanted the legislature to do their job. Uh, I think they were sick and tired of Lansing, uh, not actually solving this problem, and didn't think that a complicated plan sent to them was a way to actually get it done. Uh, I don't think it had anything to do with, a, with an unwillingness to pay taxes, not, not with everyone. I mean, there were, since 2014, there have been 156 local road millages on the ballot, 142 of them have passed, 91 percent. I think people are interested in the, in the legislature actually solving this problem. And just to correct one more thing, the, the, 
that no one is reporting, as far as I know, unless Arlen Mikoff told you that this in caucus, that the road discussions fell apart because of the HIC attacks. That's just not true. So I'm not sure where that's actually coming from. And maybe, again, this is a political Rorschach test. That that's how you see it, why it actually fell out. But I'm pretty sure you were in no vote anyway, so I'm not sure why they'd be talking to you about it. All right, so Senator Hertel, one of the questions that has come from the audience, we did have a, um, uh, some announcement here from Senator Mikoff today that said that the compromise that was last agreed to behind closed doors dealt with $800 million in new revenue, $400 million coming from an additional gas tax of 6.5%, and another $400 million of it coming from uh, driver registration fees and additional fee on electric vehicles and uh, heavy weight trucks uh, a fee. Is that something that you could support? And if not, what taxes would you raise to fund the roads? Uh, I think the idea that we actually make heavyweight trucks pay their fair share is good. That's, I, think, I think it's a start. Uh, and I, I think that uh, the, the discussions we're heading into a way I could support if we took prevailing wage off the table in the state. Now, but weren't proposal one voters saying they just wanted the roads fixed? Are you not bringing another subject in oh, by saying prevailing wage first has all, to be in this? First of all, I think prevailing wage is essential to getting our, our roads fixed. The number one indicator of whether a road is going to fail or not is the quality of the person actually building that road. You know, especially in Michigan where we have the freeze and uh, thaw that we have, which is, by the way, the number one problem with our roads, which is why it costs so much more in Michigan to actually fix them. We're a high water state and also we have the freeze and thaw. The, the number one indicator, though, is the quality of the actual person. The, the, the spacing of the bubbles that you have to do in order to prevent the freeze and cracks from actually happening are because we have highly skilled workers. Those are the people that can actually do it. So I think it's essential that if we're going to actually be investing this money in road, we want quality, uh, qualified people to do it. Uh, and I don't, I, I don't think that, prevail, that cutting prevailing wage is going to make that happen. Hey. Cutting prevailing wage doesn't buy us any savings on roads unless you address Davis-Bacon. So I, I don't understand why that's become a central point of your Until we address points. what? Uh, Davis-Bacon. That's the federal act. And as long as we've got our funds mixed in, it doesn't matter. All right. So you can talk about prevailing wage all you want, but uh, that, that's not part of the plan. Now, one of the, one of the elements of this plan also is that we should have some type of income tax relief baked into this. The senator's plan, Senator Arlen Mikoff's plan, is that as long as state revenues come in over the rate of inflation, then we should have a gradual rollback of our 4.25% income tax. Is that something that you think needs to be part of this discussion, Senator Kolbeck? Well, I voted in support of Senate Bill 414, which had that as part of the package. That was part that reprioritized the $700 million of existing fund. I mean, I'm always for a tax rollback, but I, I'm always cautioned also by the fact that when I started off in the legislature, one of the first acts that we did was to stop the rollback of income tax from 4.35 to 3.9 percent. It's dead ended at four and a quarter percent. So, uh, any, you live by the pen, you die by the pen. I'm not, con I'm not convinced that it would actually go all the way down. Um, because people are still fixated on the idea that the only way to fix problems around here is to increase taxes. So would you vote yes on rolling back the income tax? No, I would not. I think that if you, I, I think it's fiscally irresponsible. If we had had that in the 90s, we would have never gotten through the 2000s. And, uh, you know, when you hear people uh, like Senator Kolbeck who have, you know, signed the, the no tax increase ever pledge, it scares me to roll it down in good times and not have any mechanism for it to go up in bad times. Uh, and you said that you'd vote for any tax increase. You said any tax increase, decrease? You'd well, support any, I mean, how small does government get? I mean, like, a, like in, in, in your world, I mean, I, I, you know, I've heard the Grover Norquist, the small enough that you could strangle it in a bathtub. Is that what we're going for here? I mean, how, I'd, small, how, small, how small would it be where you finally decided it was enough cutting in government? I'd love for us to squeeze back into the confines put by the Constitution, personally. And now, what does that mean? That means that when you, I mean, federal government, you got a lot of work to do there. I mean, no, you I start mean, looking at Article State. 1, Section 8, and you say, hey, let's squeeze back into that box. But in regards to state government, you know, don't expand the scope of, uh, how about public education? Let's look at early childhood. So government is too big. Government's too big. And we're paying for things that we don't need to be paying for and that so we could be putting into the Just to make a list, so, so you want to cut early childhood education. Yeah, go ahead. Keep going. Get more bombs in there so you can throw out one, uh, one liner. So I get it. That's go what ahead. you said, though, right? No, 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 it is. We've got to start looking at the things that are not fitting within the scope okay, great. of our let, current let's, let's make a list. So we want to know how small government's going to get. So first, early childhood education. What else? Yeah. 
go off and uh, make sure that, let's start off by the concept of freezing our government with what we currently have. That was one of the key tenets of that, that printout that you are showing to everybody. And so then, as soon as you go off and propose a free, I have people like yourself that are claiming it's actually a cut. And uh, that's kind of, uh, that's the dialogue, that's the playground politics we find ourselves in here. And it, it's tough to get through to an actual solution when you start playing word games But that, like that. that is actually how the world works. I mean, if you spend the same amount of money one year to the next, it ends up being a cut over time because of inflation. I mean, that... that we, I, I didn't well, talk uh, about um, cutting wait, wait. the inflationary adjustments. I mean, that's, that's baked into every single budget. You're on appropriations now. You understand that every single year there's a um, portion of it that's given away to inflationary adjustments. And that's, that's a separate line item from what you're talking so about, you're not, which is so increasing the scope and scale of different programs. So, you, so there will be no inflationary freeze in any of your budgets? I wasn't proposing that at all. Okay. Well, well now, but doesn't yeah. other areas in the budget increase by the rate of inflation? So if you freeze, if you freeze any more um, spending increases, but the costs are increasing, doesn't that create a problem? That, no, I'm saying it's already embedded in there with the inflationary adjustments. And I don't remember what the amount is. Well, it's only embedded in there if we get more money. It's uh, obviously there are years we have less money. We yeah, make cuts because of that. Yeah, you've got to go off and cut, and, and that gets into the discussion over what's the purpose of the budget stabilization fund, right? So great. What, where, where are the cuts still? Yeah, let, 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 why don't we get down to actually what you want to cut? I, I mean, already told you. I think, how do I we get we did, to a solution I think, I think here, we did. And, I, I think he I, did answer a couple. He, he did give us a couple uh, specifics there on yeah. what he was going to cut. And I gave cut. you a plan not just for those first the first item here, first year, but I gave you some big items in regards to how to improve services while cutting costs in the area of health care. And so you can choose to ignore them, but you don't really have to go very deep when you're talking about $1.2 billion savings opportunity. And, and just to be clear here too, Senator Hertel, as far as the increases of taxes, are you okay with the corporate income tax being raised to pay for the roads? Yes. And okay. Or, and or broaden. Okay, and so the current uh, proposal that's being circulated right now is to raise $900 million by raising the corporate income tax. Is that something that you would sign as that ballot proposal is being circulated? Yes. Okay. All right, very good. We've got... Uh, but I want to point out real quick... You didn't quick. ask me that. No. I'm, I'm <laughs> I, I know the answer for you. But, but I think the difference between Senator Colbeck and myself is, is that while I am in the minority and realize that I'm not going to get everything I want in this process, I realize that I have to compromise. I mean, best policy positions are done when someone, when people from the left and the right actually sit down, work together. That's how we used to do do, do this business. Please that's understand. how we did it for, yeah. that's how we are used to do willing, it for Are you willing to compromise? I, Is compromise part of your solution, Senator Polk? Anybody who's worked with me on any solution know, and any specific bill knows that I'm all about working to get the best solution possible for everybody. So there's been a lot of give and take whenever I talk about bills. But please understand that it was a bipartisan rejection of Proposal 1 it was a bipartisan proposal that got us into Proposal 1 in the first place. It was a bipartisan support that actually opposed the latest Senate plan that came out. It's bipartisan support that actually got it through. So if you want to divide this up into political camps, I mean, go for it. But I think people are tired of partisan politics. I, think, I'm, I don't think I'm talking about partisan politics. What I'm talking about is smart people from both sides sitting down and actually working together. Well, and, that's how, and that's how this town, let me finish, please. That's how this town used to work. Yeah. Uh, now all we do is lob bombs at each other and, and attack each other and uh, you know sit and, sit and play only to the, the far left and the far right of our parties. I mean, we have a responsibility to all the people in the state. All right, we've we got need to sit down and work in the middle and actually get something done. We've got two minutes left to go in this exchange, and we are going to have a minute closing statement. Senator Colbeck, go ahead with your minute. All right, there you have it. Senator Hertel has pleaded his case for tax increase to fix our roads. I pleaded my case for a solution that does not increase taxes. The choice is now yours and the choice of our colleagues back up in the Senate, in the House, and over in the Romney Building. If you believe that Senator Hertel has made an effective case for tax increases, please tell Senate Majority Leader Arlen Mikov and Speaker Cotter that you support their plans, his plans for tax increases. If you believe that I've made an effective case for fixing our roads without a tax increase, please call the Senate Majority Leader and, speak, uh, Senate Majority Leader and Speaker in support of what I like to call the Common Ground Plan, which is what I talked about in regards to the $700 million and, built, and upgrading our roads. The plan is quite simple and can be executed by the end of this week if the Senate Majority Leader and Speaker wish to do so. All that we need to do is focus upon what both the House and the Senate plans already have passed out of both chamber and they have in common, namely putting $700 million in existing funds towards roads, encouraging competitive bidding, and promoting road quality through enhanced warranties. The mechanics of doing so are very straightforward. 
House Bill 4610, 4611, 4613 are currently on the House floor for consideration. There has been a motion to, uh, for Senate Bill 414 to discharge it from committee and put it on the House floor as well. At least that's my understanding. Now, if you simply, uh, all that we have to do is remove the tie bars to the tax increase bills from House Bill 4610, 4611, okay. 4613. Move the existing quality road provisions there. in House Bill 4615 to 4613. Ensure that 100 percent of that $700 million that's restricted in Senate Bill 14 goes to, 414 goes to the roads. Then you just pass those bills, and we've got a way to fix the roads faster than they're falling apart without raising taxes. A All responsible right. Thank road you. fix is within our grasp. Let's get her done. Thank you, Senator Kolbeck. Uh, Senator Hertel, uh, Senator Kolbeck did go a little over there. I'll let you have two minutes if you'd like to for your closing thoughts. I think I'll be fine. Okay. Uh, the, you know, there's one thing I want everyone to take away from this, this discussion and debate. The vast majority of the legislature is in agreement. Both sides agree, that, both sides of the leadership, that we need some new revenue to fix our roads. It, it, I believe that we've heard a lot of interesting issues, but we've heard very little specifics from Senator Kolbeck. Uh, and I respect the fact that you, that you have these opinions, but I just don't think that they're true. Uh, and I think it's time for us to sit down, work together, like we used to do in this, in this legislature, in this building, where Republicans and Democrats sit down and actually spend time not worrying about their constituencies back home necessarily, but worrying about all the people. Not worrying about just the people on the left or just the people on the right. Uh, not worrying about the special interests that get us elected. What we really should be worried about is a long-term solution for the people of Michigan. And I'm willing to sit down with anybody from the other side of the aisle and work to get that done. Thank you. All right, very good. Thank you, Senator Hertel. I'd like to, um, I'd like to thank all the, uh, the people who have come out to uh, watch this debate. I'd like to thank Senator Kolbeck for actually issuing the challenge and uh, Senator Hertel for actually accepting the challenge as well. Uh, at this particular time when the uh, leaders are going behind closed doors and talking about these issues, I thought it was very important to have a public discussion and at least get some of the issues out. And I appreciate both Senator Hertel and Senator Kolbeck for bringing those out in a public dialogue. Let's give them both a round of applause. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.